So, uh, I don't do a whole lot of speaking on Bigfoot or really anytime really presenting to a lot of people, but uh, the last time that I did a presentation for you all was the PT film. And Charlie wanted me to do another speaking event for you all. And I really didn't want to do the Patterson Gimlin film again, just because I know it's a lot of the same people and I just didn't, you know, want to repeat the same information. So I want to do something different. And so I asked a buddy of mine, his name is Matt Pruitt, that some of you all might know, I think one of the best researchers out there. And I asked him, so like, what's a good topic that I could talk about? Cause I was like, I got nothing. And um, he was like, well, I can't really tell you what to do a presentation for, but he said, you just need to pick something that you can be passionate about or something that you're gonna delve into and really enjoy talking about, and that's what matters. And so, after watching uh, a lot of stuff, flipping through some things, I finally kept seeing a common theme that kind of kept coming up, and it was about Paul Freeman and his Freeman footage. And I think it's something that's a little misunderstood and a lot of people don't know about. So, since I did the PG film, I think it's only best to do the Paul Freeman footage, which I think personally is the second best video footage out there of a possible Sasquatch. So my presentation is called Freeing the Man Behind the Camera, a deeper look at Paul Freeman and the Freeman footage. A little play on words there for those playing along at home. <laughs> so basically, uh, the setting that we're going to be talking about a lot is the Blue Mountains, which is the southeastern Washington state. I know that this, this map's not coming through really, really well here, but it was about the best one I could find. Um, so here's the city of Walla Walla. Uh, we do have Mill Creek kind of watershed here. You can't see the line on this picture, but basically here's the line between the border. This is Washington, this is Oregon, the Matilla National Park right there, and the Blue Mountains would be kind of stretching right through here. So this area has been always very hot for Bigfoot activity. You have reports dating back to the 1900s. There's actually one that's uh, before that even. But uh, one United States Forest Service officer named Wayne Long, who we'll actually see come up a little bit here in um, a couple slides later, back in the 1960s, he said he was starting to get a lot of reports coming to his office for Bigfoot. John Green also spent a lot of time in this area. He actually um, took a lot of reports in Washington and Oregon and stayed there for a while. And in 1965, I wrote on here, but it's actually 1966 because there was some discrepancy on that. A uh, local newspaper took a report from a guy who was riding a bike um, that saw really big human-like footprints on Upper uh, Creek Road and whenever he reported those, none other than Roger Patterson came to investigate those. And then one year later, he would actually end up filming the Patterson-Gimlin footage. So a lot of history there. So we're gonna we're following around Paul Freeman during this. Uh, most of the presentation is gonna take place between 1982 and 1992. So like this stretch of a decade in the Blue Mountains. Paul Freeman, he was born August 10th, 1943, died April 2nd, 2003, he was 59 years old. He did die of complications from diabetes. But the main thing that we want to know about him is that he was a lifelong outdoorsman. He hunted, he was a fisherman, and very underestimated just how good of a tracker he actually was. And kind of during some of his free time, he did like to paint, sculpt, uh, draw, and also he was a really good mechanic, so keep in mind of that, because that does play into the story some. Uh, he's definitely known in the Bigfoot community for his passion and definitely a lot of tracks, tracking ability, and you can kind of see a picture of him here. And then I like to say that he had this certain archetype. He was six foot five, roughly around average 300 pounds, known for his tracking, known for his time really outdoors and looking for Bigfoot. And it's kind of funny that we actually have the same archetype here in Kentucky with Tom Shea because that's someone else who's a kind of larger than life human being who's actually done a lot of tracking, spends a lot of time in the woods and is known really for his uh, cast collection as well. <laughs> so you can kind of see somewhat of a similarity there. Uh, Paul Freeman, a little more controversial, I think, than Tom Shea, but uh, so 
he had a sighting and his sighting took place uh, whenever he took a job as a United States Forest Service watershed patrolman. So basically his responsibilities as a patrolman were to check a lot of the gates, uh, keep track of people and livestock and make sure they stayed outside of the Mill Creek watershed and in general kept track of wildlife populations. Um, the Mill Creek watershed is a prime source of water for the city of Walla Walla since uh, 1918 and it's only open to the public during the short elk season. So basically if you have a watershed, you're getting a lot of your water uh, for your city through there. So you want to kind of keep that protected. We don't want people swimming in it, you know, letting their livestock drink out of it and stuff. So his whole job was to just keep people out of that area. So on around noon on June 10th, 1982, he was riding along on Tiger Canyon Road. And during that time, he spotted a herd of elk. And so as part of his job, he needed to keep track of them. So he got off and he was gonna to try to get a rough head count of the elk in that area. Whenever he was walking along the Tiger Canyon Road, which is an old logging road, it's just outside of the Mill Creek watershed. He started getting this strong odor. And he said that it, it smelled really bad and um, Freeman thinks that it might have been someone that actually went missing last fall and that the body might be in decay. So he kind of wanted to check that out. Maybe this missing person's nearby. And so whenever he was going up the road, a Sasquatch comes down a hill and steps right in front of him out into the road. Paul Freeman sees the subject, starts to back up that subject starts to walk away from him down the old logging road and every once in a while looking back at him. Paul Freeman describes the subject somewhere around eight to nine feet tall, dark reddish brown, body hair all over it, long arms that hung down to its knees and it walked with kind of a hunch over it. So as reporting it to his superiors, he files a report with the United States Forest Service and Umatilla National Forest Service, which was basically his boss. And during that time, the United States Forest Service does an investigation into the track. So we see Wayne Long here, who was assigned to do the investigation. Here he is in a news article taking a picture. And you can probably see this a little bit here, but here's one of the tracks of the Squatch. And then roughly here is a track of a person, like a boot print there in comparison. So. Uh, whenever they go to, up to the logging road, they find nearly 25 tracks going down this logging road and many locals end up seeing the tracks as well because it is on public land. It's an old logging road. You could just drive right up there. And actually fun fact too, since Paul Freeman filed a report that he had a strong odor and like I said, there was a missing person in that general area, actually a local search and rescue team ended up going up there trying to find that missing person too and they ended up seeing the tracks as well. So Wayne Long there and several Forest Service employees spent a couple of days trying to figure out what in the world happened to Paul Freeman. And they do a really fun experiment that someone suggested that they do and they shaped a steel plate that was roughly the size of a plaster cast that they pulled at the scene and they placed the steel plate underneath the back of a truck and they jacked up the truck and to try to push it into the ground and the distance that they actually made the impression was about half an inch on the reports some of the tracks that they found went in almost two inches into the hard logging road so they didn't come anywhere even close to the depth that they were looking for uh, Wayne Long says, and I quote, it's the first time I've ever seen a foot like this. So, um, the, the Forest Service then opens up the investigation a little bit wider and they call in a U.S. Border Patrol tracker famously known named Joel Hardin. And he was actually on vacation at the time, so he cut his vacation short and they flew him in to take a look at the tracks. And he basically says that the tracks are fake. He doesn't believe that they're real. He doesn't believe Paul Freeman. They take several people out there whenever he's looking at them and he's saying what he doesn't like about them. He thinks that they're fake. And actually Paul Freeman, for some reason, just disappears from the scene. Like he, Joel Harden kind of says that maybe like Paul Freeman didn't like what he was saying. So he ended up just kind of 
ditching and stuff like that and didn't really kind of defend himself. But uh, pretty much after that, said it was fake and stuff. But Paul Freeman <laughs> vows that what he saw is the truth and he vows to that day to always carry a camera with him whenever he goes into the woods. So this is when our story kind of takes a little bit of a turn. Um, basically, whenever this happened, and I know some of you are into other cryptids and too, so Point Pleasant and stuff like that, this became just the talk of the town. So everybody wanted to talk to Paul Freeman, everybody wanted to talk to the Forest Service, everybody wanted to talk to Wayne Long. And basically, you can see here, even in a news article, and I know that that doesn't come through very well, but this is actually Tiger, uh, Canyon Road and you can see some bikers there and someone actually took the time to go up there and it does say uh, Five miles an hour Bigfoot crossing. So it kind of became a little bit of a joke and a little tongue-in-cheek I know a lot of the local people too ended up selling some Bigfoot merch and things like that So if people kind of didn't really believe it, but they all wanted to talk to Paul Freeman talk to Wayne Long and stuff So Paul Freeman because of that he took a lot of flack for his sighting and actually his quote is that people have been calling me up at home and my phone is unlisted and telling me I'm crazy and even calling my kids names and so forth. I don't think I'd report seeing a Bigfoot if I knew what I know now. Also a Forest Service employee from Walla Walla District um, from the Umatilla National Forest Service also as in quoting about the event itself. Uh, I've been completely inundated. We don't know how to handle this sort of thing. It's at the point where Paul and Wayne have no privacy. We aren't getting much done around here except this. So because of that, within about a month, Paul Freeman actually does quit his United States Forest Service job. He moves away to escape a lot of the publicity that he was getting because he didn't like it. But in a couple of years, he actually does end up returning back to Walla Walla and he does spend pretty much from then forth looking for Bigfoot very frequently. And because of that, he just wants absolute proof that Bigfoot does exist, just so people will believe him. So he kind of goes over the top about it. And uh, Grover Krantz does give him a little bit of recognition. So he started pulling a bunch of prints and stuff. And actually the prints that he pulled that day too, with the Forest Service and everything, Grover Krantz says, I think these have what's called dermal ridges. And I know we all know, kind of probably heard about dermal ridges at this point, but this is actually the first time that that actually comes up that I know of, that actually Grover Kranz is saying these are dermal ridges. So we owe Paul Freeman for finding dermal ridges, basically. And Grover Kranz, of course. So basically at this point, he spends roughly about two to three days a week on the search for Bigfoot, sometimes even more from what I've actually heard. So during this time, he, he pulls tons of trackways cast hair photos and soon to be a little bit more so bigfoot for breakfast uh, freeman actually does get a lot of attention from good morning america they did a segment on him uh, that appeared thursday morning october 29th 1918 so during that interview i actually have it here we'll watch it here in a second because it's kind of a neat piece of lore and footage if you all haven't seen it but um in that during that interview he actually does admit to faking some tracks so basically at that point, everybody goes, aha. So he admits on camera to faking a bunch of fake tracks, but actually the way the interview is kind of somewhat edited, um, what Paul Freeman was trying to say is that I did make some fake tracks. He actually did like a, a cast and got it to a shoe and he stomped around a little bit around his house and stuff. But he's basically trying to prove that like, I'm not getting hoaxed. I'm trying to reproduce these, make these footprints so I know what a fake one looks like and if I'm being faked and stuff like that. But that's not kind of the way that it's edited. But during that time, he does say he, he plans on trying to go shoot one. And in about a year's time, he does end up changing his tune on that and he puts down the rifle. But see if I can get this up here. See that there. So we'll actually take a little bit of a break here. Get it. it might take a minute to come out. There it goes. Well, 
Scotland has its Loch Ness monster, Tibet has its abominable snowman, and we've got our own homegrown American monster out in Walla Walla, Washington, of course known as Bigfoot. And Steve Fox recently was in the tracks of doing? Bigfoot. This is Bigfoot, or at least what Hollywood thinks he looks like. This is a story about Bigfoot and about Paul Freeman, Wes Summerlin, and Rene de Hinden, and what they saw, or said they saw, or believed they saw, or didn't see. Whatever the case may be. There have been an awful lot of Bigfoot sightings in the Pacific Northwest, so I flew to Walla Walla, Washington, to find out what the commotion is all about. You look right back at it, and he right off again. Uh, what, what did he do? What did he, he do? Got down, just like he did. He said he put his hands on his mom's knees, and if you don't blame me, I'll take you a man right here. He brought with us Michael Dennett, a Bigfoot investigator and skeptic who wanted to meet some of the folks who claimed to have seen the critter. We want some really solid evidence of it. You sure say he wouldn't know a bear if he saw it? I'm saying that's possible. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, hold it. Now, wait a minute, this ain't be a real root. <laughs> this is just part than just words. Now, let's don't be calling nobody a liar. If they're gone by, get nothing in their mouth besides teeth. Enough already. Here are the facts, <laughs> such as they are. Bigfoot, or Sasquatch, or the abominable snowman, has been reported in various parts of the world for centuries. He's recorded in the tribal lore of Pacific Northwest Indians, said to be 800 to 1,000 pounds, kind of a cross between a gorilla, a man, and a bear. Just dirty old thing, you're nasty. Wes Summerlin, a hunter and trapper who's part Apache Indian, says he's seen a small family of the creatures several times over the past 10 years. You've been, what, tracking for most of your life? Yep. Oh, yeah. Well, there's three of them up there. Hey, it's part of the, part of the element. It's there. You live with it. You get along with it. I don't know. I always had the feeling that they were kind of attracted to Grandpa. And it seems to me that a few of them may actually know him, you know, and come to trust him. Hey, you ever look one of them in the face? It's just like looking at a human. They look just about like you, except the taller. I'm built about like you, and they're a little humpy on the top. Paul Freeman, also a hunter, says he has seen Bigfoot a couple of times. We took Paul up in a small plane to look for Bigfoot from above the remote Blue Mountains, where he first spotted the creature in 1982. Down there is where I saw him. On that, on that ridge down there, yeah. I think the Sasquatch, or Bigfoot, was on the other side of this uh, little patch of timber here watching those elk, because that's why they were so spooky. He come right down past this bush here and, and down this... Uh, by this bush here and, and stepped right out into the the road and then went he just turned and looked at me and i started backing away since the turn of the century there have been more than 2,000 reported sightings of bigfoot himself or his massive footprints plaster casts are often made of them by believers paul and west took me into the mountains to a secluded site where an alleged bigfoot track was found a couple of months ago See, there's a track up here now uh, here this was made uh, Early this spring. This, you say, is a track. These are toes. That's a foot. That's right. That's the ball. Where sit down, take your shoe off, or take mine off. And lay your arch right in here. See, so you go down here and come back up again for the toes here. What does this prove, if anything? Proves that something's moving. What does that mean? Moment of truth. What does that mean? That means my guy, they've they got to change their attitude or they got a fake foot. Have you ever investigated a Bigfoot sighting that's seem to you to be legitimate? No. Never? No. Footprints can be faked. They have been faked. We know of at least one person who claims that he hoaxed Bigfoot. He tried to make fake foot. Yes, I did. To create prints. Yes, I did. And then you admit that was a fake foot, but you say these are real? These are scratch marks or claw marks. This is all hair. That's that weird That's hair. Yeah. Yeah. Can we take this and get it analyzed? You betcha. So we had the stuff analyzed. A New York City laboratory said it was just like human hair, but that doesn't necessarily prove it didn't come from Bigfoot, a human-like creature. My contention is, is that the b burden of proof is on the promoters of Bigfoot. Enter Rene de Hinden, who's been traveling around the country for years following up on Bigfoot clues. He owns 51% of the best and most controversial evidence to date. What does that film show? 
It's an animal with fluid motion. A one expert tracker told us, if this is a man in a fursuit, he had to be trained to walk this way. I'm intrigued by the mysteries. And of course, like the old time prospectors, at the end of the rainbow, you hope to find what you're looking for. Some people see Bigfoot because their life is boring, because to see a bear is not exciting, but to see a Bigfoot is. <laughs> I'm gonna shoot one. Put one down, you know, for good. I think I'd give him a Bigfoot just fine. Would you give him a Bigfoot? Yeah. You see, you never will be able to prove that the Sasquatch does not exist. The myth, yeah. the legend, will carry on. Well, I don't know. But if he exists, I wonder if he has a TV set. And if he exists, I wonder if he watches at 7 in the morning. The joke. It's 56 minutes after. We'll be right back. Later this morning, Diane Keaton. Tomorrow, Dolly Parton. And of course. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so yeah you can kind of see like it, it was kind of portrayed as like a little bit of a tongue-in-cheek piece i think everybody can kind of see well, that like the like explain the edit because they made it sound like he's hoaxing the tracks yes he was making them to demonstrate the difference and they yeah. never they never did elaborate on that yeah and they left kind of left that part out a little bit and that, we get that from mike freeman who's a sean who said he was actually in the room whenever they were doing that interview and how it's kind of edited like he's kind of talking about oh yeah i fixed some tracks and then all of a sudden on you can hear his b-roll in the background of kind of talking but it's already moved on to these scratch marks on this you know piece of wood and stuff like that so it's kind of edited kind of funny and then also you can the expert person that they had come along you know and stuff like that and uh you know what they saw or thought they saw, and then Renee DeHinden and classicness. You cannot disprove that big question exists. <laughs> <laughs> the legend will live on. <laughs> that's, that's my best Renee DeHinden that's impression good. there. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so basically moving on from that point, you know, between the original sighting, Joel Harden, you know, the expert tracker saying all oh, these are fake between the tongue-in-cheek Good Morning America interview and stuff that went out to more of the general public and stuff like that. At this point, Paul Freeman's kind of reputation is starting to go pretty far in the dirt. But things do start to change a little bit. So hot on the trail in 92. So Paul Freeman is pulling a lot of evidence in 1992. Reports are rolling in from start to finish. Uh, he's pulling trackways, he's pulling casts, he's pulling pretty much everything. And I want to give uh, Cliff a shout out here from the North American Bigfoot Center. Um, Charlie kind of helped me, <laughs> kind of push him to get back with me. But basically, you know, everybody knows Cliff has the museum now up there in Oregon. And actually in his museum, Cliff inherited pretty much all of Paul Freeman's evidence and stuff like that. And this is actually a picture of Paul Freeman's map that he used that you can see in the museum. And you can see where he's marked certain points of interest. I know this doesn't show up super well, but he's got like writing on there and stuff too. But the point I'm trying to make is that basically Paul Freeman was documenting everything. And he was doing the best that he could to understand these creatures to put him in the best place to see them. So, and April 14th, 1992. And this is one that people don't really know a whole lot about this was on a Tuesday at about 11 a.m. Paul Freeman is slowly cruising a mountain road 10 miles above five points and close to Mill Creek watershed and he was hunting for mushrooms at the time alongside the road at about 30 yards from the road he spotted a Bigfoot in the brush near the road he described it as about six seven weighing somewhere between five to seven hundred pounds I know it's a little bit of a range there but black with some gray hair and very similar to the one that he saw in 1982. Once he exited the vehicle and slammed the car door, the Bigfoot took off into the dense tree line and underbrush nearby. Paul Freeman, who had his video camera with him, actually gave pursuit and moved further up the road, hoping that the creature would double back across the road to head toward the protection of the nearby watershed. Sure enough, it did and Paul Freeman was able to capture about 15 seconds of film footage at about 70 yards of this creature 
dashing across in front of him and looked back at Freeman for a brief second and took off toward the watershed. Freeman, in hot pursuit, tracked the creature for about half a mile through the underbrush and during this whole time he is filming and he's getting big fresh tracks that can be seen on the video footage. As he pursued the creature, Freeman, you can hear him heavily breathing because he was a little bit of a larger guy, which is kind of comical, but uh, footfalls can be heard in the video and with him saying, and I quote, I've been waiting 10 years for this. And uh, he does lose the creature because the creature's too fast and it eventually escapes him. So in the excitement, he did not use the zoom feature on the camera, unfortunately for us. And actually in, in the video footage, the creature is very, very small. It's a blob squatch, but you do see something running across the screen. It's a little pixelated and stuff, but uh, because of that, he was not satisfied with the footage, so he ended up uh, keep his pursuit uh, going forth. So, um, here's where we get to the meat and potatoes of everything. So Freeman, like I said, had been plotting out points on his map and had a pretty good idea of kind of their pattern and stuff into the Blue Mountains at this point. And August of 1992 was a very hot and dry season. And he pinpoints that D Duck Springs might be a prime location where these things are hanging out and getting some water. So there's a pond that's considered the headways of South Fork Walla Walla River, uh, one of the few places in the area where Freeman believed that Bigfoot would be able to find water during this very dry season. According to his data, it'd be a promising spot, and he planned to visit this spot every single day between August and September. He had been waiting. He had been going to the pond every day consistently for about the past week and he would normally arrive at around 6 30 a.m and stay for several hours possibly even half the day watching the pond uh, and also checking out around the pond and stuff as well so he had not really a whole lot of luck he, he pulled a, a couple little prints and stuff that were a little questionable but he decided to keep uh, going and what he had decided was that they could be going to get water but he was showing up to the pond at 6.30 or so, a little too late. He thought that they were coming a lot earlier, we'll say like 5, 4 o'clock in the morning. So he decided that he was going to get up even earlier and go check out this pond. So it's kind of fate would have it though, on August 19th, 1992, his daughter calls him and says, Dad, my car's broke down. I really need you to come over and help me get it fixed so I can get to work the next day. Um, so he does that on the morning of August 20th, 1992, and since it did take him a little while to fix up the vehicle and stuff, he had kind of missed his window of when he wanted to go, and also the window that he would normally go, so he kind of hem-hawed around about it, he was like, I've kind of missed my window, I'm not going to go today, I'll just take a break. Ends up talking himself into it, so he arrives a little bit later than normal, uh, he ended up being there at about 9 a.m. or so and he had with him an older 8 millimeter camcorder that was a hand-me-down from a relative and with this there was it, he shot his footage on that VHS tape of very low quality and I think this says a lot about like how the footage is so blurry and kind of the everyday thing because people didn't have you know multiple camcorders back then and stuff so he actually kept reusing the same vhs tape over and over again so if you tape over vhs tape over and over again the quality of it starts to degrade after a while and so actually during his actual film footage you can see some bigfoot material and then you can actually see his niece's birthday party <laughs> and then it goes straight into the freeman footage which is kind of funny but uh yeah so but that says i think that it's a real world scenario right he just just kept taping over and stuff so what he did that morning he got there to the pond parked his car unloaded the camcorder unloaded his jug of coffee he ended up walking around the pond on the far side of the pond he ended up noticing fresh tracks around the pond and he begins filming that trackway and he hears some brush popping in the distance. So I will pause there and we're just gonna watch the footage as it plays out from that point and you'll watch it from start to end and then we'll pick back up from there. <coughs> Sometimes they come here and get water. Thank you. 
show some of the threads around the pond. <laughs> now it looks like they've been here. Yeah. Been one here anyway. He's pretty fresh. Yeah, go around this bush here. See what's going on here. You know how he's just like talking to himself? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there he's come down. Oh, shit, he's come down and went back up both. Up the road, come down the road. Yeah, look at that. Sure has. Let me stay. Yeah, where he's come back up, come back up. Yeah. much up through here. I hear the brush popping and stuff. Oh, there he goes. Up here where I can see him right quick. Get up here. Get better. Picture. Better picture. Um, I wonder where the hell known thing went. It crossed right up there. Yeah. I just wonder. It should be right here. Somewhere. Two of them, I guess. Man. Oh. I wonder where they went. Oh, God. Two of them. I always see them when I'm by myself. Never see them when there's anybody else with me. See no tracks. I'm gonna look on up this road here, man. I can see some tracks where they come across. The one went up over the hill, looked like. The other one must have went up this road. I 
up this old trail. I better go back and get somebody. West and them. A little intense there. So basically, we pick back up here. So, pretty much, as we saw in the film footage, he had a one subject step out right in front of him across the trail. He does film that Bigfoot, but then loses track of it as it did disappear, as you all saw, kind of into the tree line and stuff. He ended up seeing a second subject, which he described as a smaller Bigfoot moving toward him and getting within a hundred feet of him. I do think that, that was the one that we kind of saw for a brief second there. You kind of see it in the film footage move just a little bit. And then shortly after that, he's like, oh God, there's two of them, <laughs> that kind of thing. But uh, he did say he got a pretty good look at that one. And on the side of his face, he said it was bulged out and deformed on the right side. And his quote, and the Bigfoot was snarling at me. So he does lose sight of both of them and they disappear into the foliage like he said. He thought one of them went down the trail, one of them went over a hill. Um, so he followed that trail for a, about a quarter of a mile uh, looking for more tracks after he'd kind of shut off the footage there that we don't have film footage of that. But uh, at that point Freeman got really scared. Um, he said there he had, was hearing around him whistling sounds, loud pops, and wheezing nearby. So pretty much the Bigfoot had kind of come back around and was following him. So now at this point, he's walking further into the woods. They're behind him, and then behind them is the pond and his vehicle. So at that point, he did spot a big tree that had blown over and roots that created a hole in the embankment. Freeman scuttled into the cavity. He felt strongly at that time that they were seeking him to possibly kill him. And this is his quotes on what happened. He said, I was so doggone scared. I was in a cold sweat. Finally, they calmed down and quit making their strange noises. So I got out. I crawled on my belly for a long way down in a ditch like channel and then got away to the pond and my car and got the heck out of there. After that, he did go straight home, like he said. He came home yelling for his wife, asking to call his friends and family so they could come see the amazing footage that he had just shot. Mike, his youngest son, does recall his father being pale and shaking, and he said that's the only time in his life that he's ever seen his father look truly scared, and that includes when he was on his deathbed as well. Um, so they had several family and friends come over, watch the footage. Mike actually had a bunch of like school friends over, I assume, younger boys playing video games or something like that. So those young boys were actually the first people to watch the Paul Freeman footage in his living room. At that point, uh, Paul Freeman considered his uh, goal for the last decade mission accomplished. And these are his quotes about what happened with the Bigfoots. He said, for some reason, they let me get out of there alive last Thursday. This is an interview taken a little bit few days later. I don't know what the reason might be, but I got the message. I'm not going to hunt for them anymore. So Paul Freeman uh, did end up kind of backtracking on that. He ended up actually being involved in the Bigfoot community for quite a ways after that. So one thing I, I did like of, about, and I know this, this picture is not coming through really well, but basically this is a picture of one of the prints in there. So th these are some of just my observations with the film and why I do think it probably is legit. So there's a lot of lead up in the footage. You saw he gets out of the car, he's filming, you know, around the pond. There's a, there's a lot more to it before you ever get to the meat and potatoes kind of in the middle of the film footage. He does see the first subject. One thing I do like about it is that it's just walking straight and it walks into um, what we kind of call the Christmas tree in that film footage. It's the one where, um, He's, he says in the film footage, oh, there he goes, and he's kind of like looks at him, and but that subject just walks right into that tree and like brushes into it just like it's nothing. It doesn't try to walk around it or anything. He just 
walks right into this pine tree pretty much. And I do like that. But the thing that no one talks about, and I think is one of the most compelling things about the film footage, is that after he walks into that Christmas tree, he clears the path, and he's now behind some foliage, that that subject actually stops. And is looking straight at Paul Freeman. I know that's blurry and it's kind of hard to see, but that subject stops and freezes mid walkway and stays there for like five seconds. Doesn't move a muscle. And it seems like Paul Freeman kind of loses track of it. And if you're watching it in the footage and I'll, I'll kind of replay it here in a second to talk about that so you can kind of see it in real time. But the way I guess the hair is and stuff and just you saw how big the subject was when it walked across that path, it pretty much disappears behind that small foliage. It pauses, which is just such classic Bigfoot behavior of it just freezing, thinking that it's hidden, and then it does end up walking into the tree line uh, after it paused for a little bit. I do like also in the film footage, he does see us, talks about seeing a second subject. We do think we see it also in the film footage. It does appear to be a different size, you know, than the other one. So, you know, if it's two people in a monkey suit or whatever, you'd probably need two people of different heights, two different suits. I mean, we're starting to get uh, pretty far-fetched at this point. And also after he does see the second subject, his demeanor somewhat changes during that. And whenever that smaller one, he said, came up to him and was snarling at him, you can see how he's talking. It seems like he's talking about his heart rate, 40 miles an hour. And just the way that he's talking, he seems a lot more nervous. And that seems to show through, I think, in the film footage. Also, after he sees the subjects, you don't see him anymore after that second one. So there's a lot more B-roll and footage after that as well. He didn't just shut off the camera. We do see him kind of going down the trail. He's talking to himself a little bit more, stuff like that. So. Everybody knows Jeff Meldrum, and he does play an important part um, in this presentation. So basically, Jeff Meldrum, who is a little skeptical of Paul Freeman, and ended up wanting to go talk to Paul Freeman, and he ended up coming with his brother to Paul Freeman's house, completely unannounced. No phone calls ahead of time, no postcards, it just shows up at his front door, on February 18th, 1996, demanding pretty much to Paul Freeman to talk to him, wanted to see some of his evidence and stuff like that. So after Paul Freeman lets him in his house, they talk for a little while, he's showing him some of his cash tracks, showing some of his evidence and stuff like that. He asks Jeff Meldrum and his brother, would you like to see the first tracks of the spring that I found this very morning? So Jeff Meldrum being well, I do want to see what this hoaxer has got up his sleeve. Coincidental that you happen to find some tracks whenever I'm here. Uh, ends up going into the Blue Mountains with him. And Jeff Meldrum, this is a turning point for him and his career, that he was so compelled by the trackway that Paul Freeman showed him that he became fascinated with uh, the Sasquatch subject. And I will read his quote here, word for word, as he writes it talking about whenever he's having his interview and stuff with Paul Freeman. After persistent questioning about the footprints, confided that he had located the first tracks of that spring that very morning. Too coincidental, question mark. I thought so until I examined the string of prints numbering the excess of 40. They measured roughly 14 inches in length. The ground was wet from recent rains that continued sporadically over the weekend. The last bleeding tracks of uh, Dermoglyphics are still visible and some tracks indicating that they had likely been laid down the previous night. Variations in toe position, indications of mid-foot flexibility, dynamic interactions with the varying soil conditions were clearly evident. In one print, the splaying toes pressed the first and fifth toes into sidewalls of deep impressions, producing profiles of respective digits to my knowledge, the first time this has ever been documented. So, Jeff Meldrum comes on board the Bigfoot train because of Paul Freeman. So there are some detractors, just like with every great Bigfoot investigator, and there are plenty of them. First complaint that a lot of people give is that the footage subject proportions do seem way off. That very first subject very large body, kind of a beer belly going on, 
teeny tiny head. <laughs> so, so people say that that's, uh, you know, probably um, a little bit, you know, skeptical. Maybe it's, you know, a person in a suit, stuff like that. <laughs> Renee DeHendon, who we actually saw in the Good Morning America interview, claims that the cast that Paul Freeman are making are fake. Uh, he did say that for quite a while. He definitely pushed that agenda a lot in 89. Um, he said, using the PG film tracks as the standard, he could not fathom that the tracks that Paul Freeman was pulling could look different. He referred to the toes of Paul Freeman's cast as sausage toes instead of short stubby toes. John Green, also a famous Sasquatch investigator, does say, and I quote, everything seemed just fine with Freeman until he continued to make claim after claim. Bob Titmus, as well, also made several on-site investigations of Freeman's various claims, and pardon my language here, but Paul Freeman is a damn fucking liar, is <laughs> basically what he said, which is pretty uncharacteristic for Bob Titmus because he's a pretty reserved guy, so it's kind of unusual for him to use such foul language for someone. So then in 1989, Edward B. Wynn removes fibers from a twisted tree branch presented by Freeman at the 1989 membership meeting of the International Society of Cryptozoology and tested them for chemical composition and melting point. He later concluded that the fibers were synthetic, slash man-made, and he labeled the entire presentation that Freeman had given as scientific vandalism. However, since uh, Paul Freeman did submit those hairs for sampling, it is the first hair samples to be subjected to DNA sequencing analysis in the Bigfoot subject, as far as we know. And also, a lot of people say nobody's that lucky. So Paul Freeman did pull a lot of casts. He had hand casts, knuckle prints, foot galore, butt print even. So after a while, people started saying, you know, he's gotta be faking some stuff. There ain't no way. And I, I like this uh, screenshot I pulled from Good Morning America interview there, the, the stain kind of on his face. So there's some key takeaways from this presentation. Basically, I'll leave it up to you. If you believe Freeman, believe all his evidence, even Cliff will tell you that there are some prints in his collection that are fake. You know, it, it kind of goes either way and definitely those two camps, whether he's legit or not legit, are sunk in pretty deep. But I'll leave it up to you to kind of look through it a little bit more but there's a couple things that I do think that we can take away from Paul Freeman, though. Uh, there's a quote here that I like from Angela Duckworth. Um, I think I can see him. Basically, she's the founder and CEO of Character Lab, a nonprofit whose mission is to advance scientific insights that help children thrive. She's also a professor of psychology at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, she talks a lot about what it makes inside people to make them successful and no matter what they're doing and also like the mission of you know getting kids interested in science and stuff but one of her main quotes is consistency of effort over the long run is everything and um, one of her big things she talks about is grit that's also one of my favorite words because what word in the english language that you can say grit that you can envision exactly what we're talking about just by the way that it sounds so that is something that paul freeman did he consistently went out he consistently tracked, you know, and he got the data that he needed to try to be in the path of being successful and using his grit. But no matter if you believe him, not believe him, there's no doubt that Paul Freeman played a huge part in the Bigfoot community with being some of the best trackways, having, you know, the first hair sample ever be submitted for DNA analysis, you know, butt prints, hand prints, Paul Freeman footage <laughs> as well. But um, I do believe that Bigfoot and Sasquatch and all of us being here is just as much about a conservation movement and an enjoyment of going back to the great outdoors and about the community. So I know that a lot of people brought up this morning that they talk a lot about, I come out here because I like the people. You know, the Bigfoot thing is always like kind of secondary. So there's one thing I do like about Paul Freeman is that whenever Dr. Meldrum came to his house completely unannounced, demanded to see all his evidence, you know, talk to him about it, Paul Freeman could have easily just dismissed Jeff Meldrum, like, get off my property. I'm not sharing that type of stuff with you. You didn't call ahead of time. You know, it's kind of rude to show up to somebody's house unannounced and stuff. He could have easily done that. 
and that's a lot of what kind of the old school big footers did and i think that's one of the things they messed up greatly on is that they weren't willing to share their evidence they weren't willing to submit it for critical analysis i brought some casts here that i did last saturday and i love you all coming up looking at them giving your opinions i don't know what it is you know but i'm okay with submitting that and just getting some other opinions <laughs> Big footers back then, they wanted to keep it all to themselves, you know, and not share it. But Paul Freeman was willing to. And because of Paul Freeman, we have Dr. Meldrum. So Paul Freeman had a Bigfoot flame, and he passed it on to Dr. Meldrum. I am here today in front of you because someone took the time to host an event just like you're all at. Took the time, bring me to a good location, share their evidence with me, be nice to me. You heard plenty of stories this morning where people were like, help me set up my tent, ask me to come over. You're basically best buds right at the start. I had that same experience during my first time out. People offered me food. They took me to great locations. They did it all, didn't ask anything from me. So they passed their flame on to me. So what I ask you all to do going forward is to take your spark that you have for conservation, the great outdoors, and try to pass it on to someone else. Be willing to talk to your coworkers about Bigfoot, no matter how tongue in cheek, and they kind of rib you a little bit about it. Because being able to talk about this stuff and finding Bigfoot, making it more mainstream, is gonna be great for all of us. So you can pass your flame on to somebody else, and you never know who that'll be. And I think that's a good thing. Thank you. <laughs>